Hello, my friends. I'm Nick Lowry, host of the Comeback Journey podcast. For my entire life, I was trapped in a cycle of unhealthy relationships. Family, friends, lovers, all of it. Couple that with almost a decade of active drug and alcohol addiction, and that makes for quite a toxic combination. A few years ago, I decided to look inward, and what I found was that by healing, growing, and improving the relationship I have with myself, I was able to improve every other relationship in my life. It all started with me. My mission with this podcast is to empower you to cultivate healthy relationships, both with yourself and others, so you can experience a more meaningful and satisfying life. What's going on, my friends? Welcome back to the Comeback Journey podcast. On this episode, it's just going to be me talking, similar to the first episode, if anyone's listened to that. I'm just going to be going through my experiences over the last few years because tomorrow, April 23rd, 2021, I will be four years clean and sober. And I have this urge to share my experiences, what I've been through, and I feel as though it could be of some value to anyone else who may be struggling in a similar position or is considering going along this journey of sobriety. So bear with me. I have some bullet points. Um, I'm also not sure where to look the whole time. So it's going to be a little all over the place, but that being said, we're going to dive in for anyone who is new to the comeback journey or doesn't know who I am. My name is Nick. I created the comeback journey in September or October of 2019. And since then, you know, I've just been releasing podcasts. I started coaching and <clears throat> it's been a roller coaster. So I'm going to give you a little background on who I am, where I come from, you know, how I grew up and then transition into what it's been like in my life over the last four years. So I am 29 years old. I grew up in San Diego, California. I have two brothers, an older brother and a younger brother. Um, my childhood, my early childhood, I don't remember a whole lot because for whatever reason I have repressed and suppressed some of these memories. Um, my mom has a whole archive of home videos, like VHS videos uh, from when my brothers and I were young and I've seen them, like I watched them and I remember a little bit of some of them, but the majority of them that I've seen, I don't have any actual recollection of the events taking place. I just see myself as a young child on the TV. So I don't remember a whole lot prior to fifth grade, sixth grade, somewhere around then. Um, I do remember when I was six years old, let me turn my phone on, vibrate. <clears throat> Rookie mistake. That's okay. When I was six years old, my little brother was born and <clears throat> I brought him to show and tell <laughs> and pushed him in a stroller up and down the classroom. I was so stoked. At first, when I found out, <clears throat> this is, you know, one memory that I actually remember my parents, you know, asking my brothers and I if we wanted a little brother. And at first I was like, no, because I was at that point, the youngest, like the baby of the family, but I was already five, you know, so <clears throat> he was already on the way. And when he was born, it was pretty exciting. And so I brought him to show and tell, pushed him around in the stroller in the classroom. That was a, uh, that was really fun experience. Um, <clears throat> fast forward to mm, sixth grade, seventh grade. Uh, my parents got divorced and 
shortly after that, my, we're just gonna throw my phone over there. <clears throat> the vibrating, it's gonna bug me. I'm trying to stay focused. Um, <clears throat> yeah, 11 or 12, my parents got divorced. A few months later, my dad moved to Illinois. That's where both my parents are from. He had a lot of family out there. And I recently found out that a big reason why he moved back was because he couldn't afford to live in San Diego. And I had a lot of resentment and animosity towards my dad. And I, it's still there, you know, but we had a talk last summer uh, in August of 2020, you know, unpacking some of these issues and that's, that's going to be another solo podcast episode uh, where I'll dive deeper into that. But circling back, my dad moved to Illinois and um, I saw him one time, I believe, until my senior year of high school. Um, so it was, it was difficult. Um, Right around the same time my parents got divorced, my mom, my brothers, and I moved into a different house. And the reason we moved was because my mom was planning to add an addition onto the house that I had lived in as a child. It was a small house, uh, two bedroom, one bathroom for five people. When I was growing up, that was a lot. My dad converted the garage into a third bedroom. And so it gave us a little more space, but my mom wanted to add a master suite onto the back of the house. And so she hired a contractor who was the parent of uh, two other kids that I went to school with. And my mom paid him a lot of money to do the addition. And he got as far as digging trenches and laying the concrete foundation and then just disappeared and um, it never got finished. It was a, it was a nightmare. I was a kid and I was like, I didn't fully grasp it, but for my mom, mm. it was awful. And so somehow she found somebody to buy the house with a poured concrete foundation in the back for an unfinished room addition. But anyways, we moved into a new house it was a pretty cool setup because we were right down the street from my uncle, my mom's brother, uh, my aunt, and uncle, my cousins, you know, five houses down the street. So that was really cool. Uh, we were in that house for a few months and then we went on vacation the summer before my eighth grade year in school. And we were gone for two weeks uh, to Illinois, visit family. And when we came back, uh, I remember one of my friends uh, and his parents picked us up from the airport. We got back to the house and I was the first one, you know, I asked my mom, can I get the keys? Ran up to the house, opened the door and stepped into water. And what had happened was a pipe had burst in the bathroom and had been spraying water out full force for five days. And so the whole house was just flooded and, you know, we ended up having to stay with some family friends and, you know, bounce around a little bit. We ended up in an apartment and just waited until the uh, repairs were done on the house. And, you know, looking back on it now, it was, it was rough for me, but can't even imagine how difficult that must have been for my mom because she had just had this massive issue with the previous house and then we move in we've we haven't even been there six months and then all this stuff happens and it was uh it was rocky for a while there and I also had this this growing discontent because you know my dad had left and I was picking fights with my brothers and, you know, instigating issues that didn't need to be there. And it was, it was causing a lot of problems. And 
I was generally at the center of the issues, at least involving my brothers. Um, anyways, moving on. I went to Catholic school, first grade through eighth grade. My older brother did, my younger brother did. We all went to Catholic school. Um, when I got to high school, I went to an all boys Catholic high school for just a brief period of time my freshman year. And my locker got broken into and some stuff got stolen. And, um, you know, for whatever reason, my mom had tried to talk to the office. They couldn't do anything. However it happened, I ended up transferring to uh, the public school in the neighborhood that I was now living. And I'd never been to public school. I didn't know a single person at that school except my older brother. And as I mentioned, we weren't really getting along at the time. And so it was a massive culture shock. And, you know, there were kids making out in the hallways, which like at the school I'd previously been to, you know, um, we weren't even allowed to hold hands with members of the opposite sex or the same sex. Like it was very strict, rigid protocol for Catholic school. And so I go to this public school and it was just wild to me. And that first year I just really, you know, kept to myself and I would go to school and I would come home and go to school and come home. And that was pretty much it. And, you know, most of the time I would eat lunch with uh, my brother and his circle of friends, but it wasn't an ideal situation for me at the time. Um, and just to, to mention something, you know, I brought up that my, my brothers and I didn't get along very well at the time, my little brother, he was a lot, he was a lot younger. So this doesn't really involve him, but my older brother and I, uh, we didn't get along. That was mainly due to me. And yet I was an asshole and he would still welcome me to come sit with his friends at lunch. Cause I didn't have any friends. It just speaks to the kind of person that he is. So very grateful for that. Um, my sophomore year of high school, you know, I started to make some friends and um, New Year's Day, 2007, I was in my bedroom late morning and I heard my mom's phone ring. I heard her answer it in the kitchen and then she just let out this piercing scream and I ran out there and she had collapsed on the kitchen floor and she had just found out that her brother, my uncle John had been stabbed and killed in, in Illinois. And so that was uh, sent shockwaves through the whole family. You know, we flew back for the funeral and um, it was an open casket and it was very strange to me. I'd never seen a, a dead body before. Um, but it was, uh, it was a rough time for me. Um, later that year, 2007, I got into my first uh, romantic relationship. And that relationship lasted, you know, on and off from 2007 until 2015. It was a, a long relationship. Um, also, you know, later on in high school, Shortly after I had gotten into this relationship, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. And at that time, my older brother had moved to Seattle for college. My little brother was, I don't know, 10 or 11 years old. And um, so at some point, I don't remember uh, specifically the chronological order of events, but Shortly after my mom was diagnosed with cancer, my dad ended up coming back from Illinois to, you know, help out. And <clears throat> it was uh, it was a difficult time, you know, it just seemed like one thing after another 
over a span of just a few years. And I was having some serious issues. Um, but just to circle back briefly, the summer of 2017, after my uncle had died, before I got into this relationship, um, I smoked weed for the first time and drank alcohol for the first time. Not drank alcohol for the first time, but got drunk for the first time. And um, it, it felt good because I felt like I was fitting in a little bit. Um, it wasn't necessarily that I was hanging out with like a bad crowd. I only had a couple friends. Um, but it was, uh, it was the start of something bigger. And in 2009, early 2009, my uh, senior year of high school, uh, I tried Oxycontin for the first time. Um, that was the first drug I did after uh, smoking weed was snorting Oxycontin pills. And then on my 18th birthday in 2009, I tried cocaine for the first time. And then, you know, pretty much from 18 to uh, how old was I? 18 to 25. I just, you know, did drugs and sold drugs and got into trouble, stole things. And it was just a mess. Um, but I was living two lives, essentially. You know, I had this girlfriend, at, you know, sh she was very anti-drug. And so I just didn't tell her what I was doing, at least the extent of what I was doing. She generally didn't know much of the trouble I was getting myself into. Um, and so I had this life of being a boyfriend and a, a brother and a son and a friend. And then I had this other identity where I was a drug dealer and addict and liar and thief. And they, they overlapped, you know, it's, it's hard to keep those things separate, but I kept them separate for a long time. And in, uh, January of 2015, my cousin committed suicide and this was the son of my uncle who lived down the street from my mom. And he was a few years older than me. I hadn't seen him in a while. Um, but, you know, again, just another massive shockwave through the family. And I just, you know, pulled even farther away and kept spiraling downward. And then I ended up going to rehab for the first time, uh, April 20th, 2015, a few months later. And I mainly went, you know, I, I recognized that I was having some issues, but I mainly went because I didn't want my girlfriend to break up with me. And, um, I didn't want, you know, any more issues with my mom. And so I went to rehab for 45 days and that was an interesting experience because I went voluntarily. Um, it was a nice setup essentially. Um, it was in orange County, California. They had, uh, like a women's side and a men's side. And, um, we never crossed over. There was, there was no interaction. There was like different, uh, facilities where the men would go and where the women would go and there were multiple different houses in the area and so I, I lived in one of these houses it was a nice house um, somehow I ended up getting my own room which was rare from what I gathered um, at least at first I had my own room for the first half that I was there and you know i I participated and went to meetings and, you know, did all these things that I thought I was supposed to do. But at the same time, I, was, I still wanted to fit in, you know, and I, I sought out people 
who were bringing some element of excitement or chaos. And so I ended up, you know, becoming friends as much as you could be friends with somebody you've known for a couple of weeks in a inpatient rehab facility. A couple of these people. And when I moved into my, the second house that I was in during that, during that stay of rehab, I was sharing a room and one of the kids that, you know, I had ended up befriending, um, he was, he had somehow found a drug dealer on Craigslist and the guy was leaving heroin in five hour energy bottles, like in the bushes outside the house. And so a couple of these kids that I was sharing a room with, um, you know, they were in rehab and they were smoking heroin, uh, you know, late at night, you know, generally after a drug test so they wouldn't get caught. And I didn't even say anything. I knew they were doing it. I literally like my curiosity peaked, you know, and I went over and like felt it, put it in my hand. I had smoked heroin before, but, um, you know, it was just, I don't know why I didn't say anything. Um, I didn't want to, I didn't want to be the snitch, you know? And uh, they ended up getting caught. And, you know, one of the kids that I was in there with, he, he was in there for uh, prescription pills, abusing prescription pills. And he had never even smoked heroin until he got to rehab. And what a predicament to be in. It's just, uh, you know, reflecting on it. It's, it was, it was a unique experience to be in that situation. Um, just to clarify, I remained clean and sober the whole time I was in that rehab facility. I just didn't, uh, alert staff members to what was going on with the other people. So I completed the 45 days. I got out June 5th on my birthday and uh, I went to the bar with my girlfriend. We had some beers and I figured like, as long as I'm not, you know, railing lines in the bathroom, then I'm good. And, you know, within a week, I was back at it using drugs and um, I set myself up in a position to fail. Essentially um, I had owed somebody some money who I knew was a cocaine dealer. And uh, I knew I should probably just stay away. And yet I went anyways, I could have just slipped some money under his door, you know, to pay him back. And I went to go hang out. And then just from there, the temptation was too strong. And this is uh, 2015, summer 2015. So I, you know, got back into these, you know, this downward spiral of, of drug use. And my mom found an empty bag with cocaine residue in my bedroom, told my girlfriend at the time, my girlfriend broke up with me. I was so so angry with my mom like it like my my reasoning was what business is it of yours to tell other people in my life what's going on you know she was just looking out for me and she was also looking out for my ex-girlfriend because she's an amazing person my mom's an amazing person and my mom had been through this you know with my dad that was the reason that my parents got divorced because my dad was using drugs. And so, you know, now looking back on it, I understand why my mom told her. Um, so at that point, the relationship was ended. I got kicked out of my mom's house. My dad was living in San Diego at the time. He kind of bounced back and forth. Um, you know, in my late teens, early twenties, he would go back and forth between San Diego and Illinois. And so he was sleeping on a friend's couch 
And I ended up sleeping on the other couch in the living room for a few months. And then he suggested, you know, why don't we just move to Illinois? You can get a fresh start. And I was like, let's do it. So I moved to Illinois, November, 2015. Uh, I had three jobs within a two week period of time. Also within that two week period of time, I found a cocaine dealer and essentially I would, you know, work at Starbucks in the morning and I was a server and bartender at night and I was out there about five months before I called my mom and begged her with tears in my eyes to let me come home. Um, you know, I said she could give me random drug tests, like whatever she wanted to do to allow me to come home and live at her house because I was scared, you know, I was on my own. I didn't know what was going on. I, I felt as though I had no control over my life and I was freaking out. I was having a meltdown. My mom agreed a couple of days later, flew back to San Diego, uh, in April, 2016. April, 2016. Um, and about a month, month and a half later, uh, I got a DUI for driving under the influence of controlled substance. And, you know, pretty much just continued this cycle of self-destruction and drug use and, you know, whatever other trouble I could get myself into. And uh, January 2017, I got a drug possession charge. And a few months after that, April 23rd, 2017, I went to rehab again. And uh, I've been clean and sober since. So that took a little longer than I was expecting as far as like what led up to me getting sober. Anyways, I'm going to transition to, you know, essentially continuing the story, but transitioning to what it was like, you know, when I got sober and, and what these last four years have been like. So uh, let me pause, take a little sip of coffee here. Honestly, not as bad as I thought to just talk into the, into the screen by myself. I had a crazy amount of resistance to it. I've been putting it off. I was going to do it earlier this morning. It's uh, 11.55 AM right now. And I was just avoiding it. I was like, Whoa, you know, social accountability. I posted on my Instagram page on the comeback journey, Instagram page that I was going to do this and release it tomorrow on the 23rd. So I got to do it. I apologize if I guess it's more of like a sorry, not sorry type of thing, but I ramble a little bit and this isn't super structured uh, for anyone that has listened to previous podcasts. I don't really go with a whole lot of structure. I just free flow conversation. Um, but this type of thing, you know, I have some, some bullet pointed notes, but generally it's just me going, going off top and, you know, trying to weave together an accurate representation of, you know, my life. So if you've made it this far, thank you for listening and let's get back to it. So uh, the second time I went to rehab, April 23rd, 2017, uh, just a couple days after I was admitted into rehab, I had a court date in San Diego. And so one of the staff members from the rehab facility drove me from Orange County to San Diego. A uh, quick interjection. The second place that I went to rehab was the same place that I went the first time. Um, it was familiar to me and I, I wasn't able to take any more, <laughs> anything new that was unfamiliar. I just wanted like, I knew this place, I had been there before and it was a solid place. So I went there again, much, much different the second time, which I wasn't expecting, but that was also very beneficial. But anyways, I had a court date 
in San Diego because after that DUI that I got the previous year, uh, I never paid my fines. I never signed up for the classes. I never did my uh, public work service, like picking up trash on the side of the freeway. And so I had a warrant out for my arrest. And before I went to rehab, my mom drove me down to like a bail bonds place and paid to lift the warrant and set up a court date. And so this was the court date that I had to go to. And so one of the staff members of the rehab facility drove me to the courthouse in San Diego. And the judge said that I had 60 days from that day to be enrolled in my classes and to have started my community service. And even though I was in an inpatient rehab program, uh, the judge wasn't having it. You know, I, I had already ignored my responsibilities. And so he was like, give 60 days from right now to be enrolled, to have started. And so this second trip to rehab, I did 30 days inpatient. And originally I had planned on being there longer. I didn't really have a set amount of time that I was going to go, but it was I mean, the first time I went for 45 days and it didn't work. So I was <laughs> going to go at least for 45 days, if not longer. I went for 30 days and that, that program, that rehab facility, they had downsized tremendously in the two years since I'd been there. And there was only two houses instead of, you know, two dozen. Um, the first time I went, there were hundreds of people, hundreds of men, not even including the women's side. The second time I went, <clears throat> there was less than 20 people. There were two houses. And for me, that worked a lot better. I, you know, I still had my own room, thankfully. I don't know how that worked out again, but like generally you don't share rooms in a inpatient rehab, but there weren't enough, there weren't any other struggling addicts in this program. And so pretty much everyone had their own room. Um, it was a nice house. You know, we had a jacuzzi in a backyard and we went to meetings every day. I had a lot more one-on-one -on -one counseling and therapy because of the lack of clientele currently enrolled in that program. And, uh, you know, it worked for me. And, <clears throat> you know, I got out and for some reason, because I have this, you know, my whole life I was, I wanted to fit in and I was a massive people pleaser and I had serious codependency issues. And so I was still getting drugs for people. Like people would call me, ask me for drugs, and then I would go get the drugs and bring it back like a middleman situation. And um, I was fortunate enough to have a friend at the time help me out getting a job at a restaurant. And, you know, I worked at this restaurant for a little bit still getting drugs for people on the side. And then I applied to Costco. I had an interview at Costco and I had previously applied at Costco a few years before. And I knew that they were going to drug test uh, like the second or third interview, whatever the final interview was. And I was like, I'm good. I'm, I'm sober. I don't have anything to worry about. So I had the first interview and then I I had this overwhelming urge to destroy the small amount of progress that I've made. Somebody called me for some cocaine. They wanted one gram. I called the dealer. I said, I need a gram and a half. I took the additional back to the house. Um, no one was home. I had the house to myself for a couple of days. And I knew that I had, you know, a week and a half until my drug test at Costco. 
So I jumped out the cocaine and I was on a notebook chopping it up with my debit card. And I just sat there staring at it for like 45 minutes, just like wrestling internally with, you know, trying to justify potentially doing it. And then, you know, the other half of me is like, what the fuck are you doing? Why would you even put yourself in this position? And that side won. And so I got up and I walked into the kitchen and I dumped it down the sink. And that was a very liberating feeling you know, being able to not have anyone else there, no outside influences, no other voices around me and being able to turn away from that. And yeah, it was just very liberating. So I ended up getting hired at Costco. I quit the restaurant and, um, you know, a few months later, I ended up dating somebody. And uh, it was, uh, it was a pretty cool situation, because she was the best friend of one of my best friends, girlfriends. And so it was pretty cool, you know. But about seven months the seven month mark of being sober. This was November, 2017, the uh, Sunday before Thanksgiving. I, you know, this series of events led up to me doing this, making this stupid decision that I'm about to get into. My friend Casey, he had moved to North Carolina because his girlfriend got into grad school out there. This was like the, his girlfriend was friends with my girlfriend at the time. And without any uh, prior discussion, like it turned out that like this girlfriend that I had at the time and myself, we had both individually decided before we'd even started dating that we wanted to move to North Carolina on our own because our, our besties are out there, you know, we want to be with them. And I was like, wow, what are the odds? Like, this is great, you know, but I didn't have any money, you know, I didn't know. And so, you know, test from the universe, essentially, one of my coworkers from Costco started sending me Snapchats with like thousands and thousands of dollars. And I was like, bro, how are you getting all this money? Because we work together. I work more hours than you and we make the same amount. And I know you don't make that much money. So how are you getting it? And you know, I asked him if it was anything drug related and he said, no. And I said, I want, I want in on it. You know, I could use some extra money. And so the Sunday before Thanksgiving, I asked my mom if I could borrow her second car to go hang out with a friend. I ended up picking this guy up and uh, we drove from San Diego to El Centro, California and picked up uh, some illegal immigrants and we were going to take them to LA and, you know, get paid $5,000 just to drive. And we didn't have to cross the border. We didn't have to leave the state, nothing. Just, you know, pick these people up and take them to LA. And uh, we got caught you know, my first time doing it and I got caught. That's my luck. I've had a lot of really good luck and I also get caught for a lot of stupid shit. Um, so I spent a couple days in jail. I got out the night before Thanksgiving and, you know, I was, I was freaking out because I, you know, Border Patrol agents had told me that this was a felony and that I was, you know, looking at 16 to 24 months in jail. And it was turmoil internally and externally. It was just a shit show. And, And I was sober. I'm still making these decisions. I'm seven months sober. 
you know, and, um, you know, I got out of jail after a few days and came home and the girl I was dating at the time, um, she dropped the, I love you. And I set it back and, you know, I, in the moment, I felt like I meant it. And after, you know, a week or two, I realized that, you know, I had, I had said it because I was freaking out about my situation and I was grasping on to anything that, or anyone that, you know, believed in me. And at the same time, while all this was going on, my ex that I dated, the long-term relationship, we had been in contact a little bit and, you know, essentially like I, I believed that there was some hope for her and I to get back together. And so that was another factor of why I ended the relationship that I was in uh, during this period of me getting arrested. And, you know, transitioning into 2018, I had ended the, the relationship that I was in and I was, you know, holding out hope for a little bit of time that I was going to get back together with, you know, my ex that I had dated for years and years and, you know, that didn't end up happening. And so I spent 2018 single and I, you know, pretty much just wanted to enjoy life and, and kind of see how to navigate the world while sober. And I went out to a lot of bars with, you know, a circle of friends, we would go out and hang out and I wouldn't drink. I would just, you know, be the designated driver and hang out and, you know, try to have a good time. And I also started working two jobs in 2018. So, you know, it was a, it was a year mixed with a lot of work and a lot of going out and, you know, having as much fun as I could, you know, trying to enjoy life because the repercussions from this, from me getting arrested were that I was on probation for a year. Uh, I had to call every day, Monday through Friday to see if I had to take a drug test. And that was it really, you know, I got caught for this stupid thing. I was looking at all these penalties, 16 to 24 months in jail. And I, I ended up getting one year of probation, no fines. Uh, the drug test honestly were probably a blessing because it, it kept me motivated to be sober. You know, I knew that not that I had any inclination to become intoxicated at any point, but that kind of kept those, the threat of those drug tests kept me rigid in my sobriety. Um, and then some community service, 20 hours of community service. I did puppy adoptions at a Petco. Um, all in all, I got off, I was very lucky. And so 2018 was just, uh, you know, trying to navigate through, through life and through you know, trying to figure out what I want, who I am. And turns out, spoiler alert, I didn't find the answers, but I did find some, I found a way to exist in the world without being under the influence of drugs and alcohol, which, which was, you know, huge for me. Um, transition into 2019. Um, I started dating. I'd met this, this person, um, my most recent relationship. Uh, we started dating February. 
uh, we started hanging out in February of 2019. Uh, shortly after, you know, we started, you know, seriously dating, like in a relationship. And uh, a few months later, uh, July of 2019, we moved in together. Huge step. I'd never lived with a significant other before. I've been living at my mom's for a couple of years, you know, since I had gotten out of rehab. And so um, it was an amazing experience. You know, she was an awesome roommate. It was, a, it was a lot of fun. You know, we, we both worked two jobs and so we didn't see each other a whole lot, but um, it was good. It was, uh, it was really good. Um, and then uh, December, 2019 uh, I broke up with her because of some you know some personal things out of respect for her privacy I'm not going to divulge them but I felt as though it wasn't the right fit for me and so I broke up with her and uh, she originally is from Arizona. And so she moved back to Arizona. And before she moved, I got this feeling that I had made a mistake by ending the relationship. And she thought the same. She thought that I had also made a mistake by ending the relationship. And so we decided to, you know, do the long distance thing. Um, so she was in Arizona, I was in San Diego and, you know, transitioning into 2020, uh, you know, the whole world went on lockdown in March and, um, in December, 2019, uh, I quit Costco. I worked there for two and a half years. I took a management job at the restaurant, the second job that I had. So I was managing and bartending at this restaurant. And then, you know, March hit and the restaurant closed and I was unemployed. And uh, I signed up for like a course to get my real estate license. And then shortly after that, uh, I hired my friend, Jeremy J. Griff to help me build a business, you know, essentially with this the comeback journey. Um, and that was what I devoted a lot of my time to in, in 2020, you know, spring and summer. And, you know, I just, I really focused on that. And in August, I had this August of 2020, I had this realization that, you know, maybe I wasn't fit to be in a relationship. Like I had these issues that I needed to work through on my own and, you know, things of that nature. And, and so I ended the relationship again. I broke up with my girlfriend again for a second time over the phone because I was in California and she was in Arizona. And it was a relatively brief phone call and uh, that was that was it. And I didn't hear from her for months and months. And honestly, like at first, I thought that it was good because it wasn't constantly resurfacing these these emotions uh, and these thoughts that I didn't necessarily want to deal with. Um, and. you know, turns out it slowly started to take a toll on my mental and emotional health. And, you know, from September to December of 2020, I started losing momentum and I started losing the motivation to put any effort into the comeback journey and to, you know, try to build my coaching business and, and, you know, continue with the podcast. And I was just, I was lost. Like I didn't know 
I didn't know what to do. And in uh, December, my ex, uh, she reached out to me out of the blue and, you know, asked if I had some time to talk. Um, so we talked and, you know, it, it kind of helped me to release some things. Um, and shortly after that, um, I had been working, sorry if I'm all over the place with this, uh, timeline, but I'm pretty sure that I'm making it easy enough to follow along. Um, this is all 2020. So October of 2020, I got a job at PF Chang's and I worked there for about five weeks and then uh, California shut down indoor and outdoor dining again due to the pandemic. And I, uh, the day after Christmas, I asked my manager uh, how long I had to work at the company before I had to transfer. He said, officially six months, unofficially, where do you want to go? And I said, you know, I don't know, Texas, Arizona, preferably um, Arizona. I had this, you know, Texas is still on my list, but Arizona wasn't as scary because it's right next to California. And, you know, I was moving alone and at least I wanted to. And my manager said, you know, he may know, you know, a manager somewhere and he'll get back to me. And uh, he emailed me two hours later and said, this is the name of the manager of the Scottsdale, Arizona location. She's down to have you transfer, give her a call. And so, uh, like I said, this is the day after Christmas 2020. So a couple of days later, I drove out to Arizona and started looking at apartments and I ended up moving out here on January 18th. So it was a very fast prog uh, process. And, you know, now I'm here in my apartment. Um, I live alone. I've been here about three months. Um, you know, it's a little weird because my ex and I had talked about moving to, to Arizona and Arizona had been on my list for a while of like places I potentially wanted to live after I decided to not go to North Carolina. Um, you know, I, I thought Arizona seemed pretty cool. And then turns out I met this girl who's from Arizona. And so we had devised this plan that we were going to move there. Then she did move there. And so, you know, my plan had been to move out there to be with her. And then I ended up moving out here to, you know, just on my own. Um, but we live very close to each other and um, we don't talk. So it's, it's a little weird. Um, you know, I haven't seen her since I've been out here, but it's just strange. The whole situation is a little strange, but that being said, moving to Arizona, moving out on my own has been phenomenal and challenging all at the same time. You know, I'm, I'm reliant on myself to, you know, pay my bills and do the things that I need to do to survive in this world. Um, I'm coming to recognize that you know, due to Arizona being so fucking hot in the summer, um, I'm currently working as a server. And so, you know, during the summer, from what I gather, there's not a whole lot of money to be made because people aren't going out as much. So that's what I'm currently at is trying to figure out, you know, what's, what's next. And I have some things in the works as far as the comeback journey. So you know, we'll see how things turn out, but it's been, like I said, challenging and phenomenal to be out here because I have to navigate alone 
through the day to day and, and through my interactions with people and, you know, how I present myself in the world. And, um, at the same time, while I, while I enjoy that, I also have this, this little part of me that is addicted to chaos and, It's not often, but occasionally I have the thought of like, I need some shit to go wrong <laughs> because when things are going smoothly, it's, uh, it's not, that's not the norm for me. You know, the majority of my life has been tumultuous. And so I'm trying to find the best way for me to exist in the world of, to exist in a world where I can balance freedom with safety and security. And, you know, it's, it's tough because I desperately, desperately want to not have to work in a restaurant and to, you know, do the things that I love and also be able to support myself and to be able to, to want that and also be a generally impatient person is a recipe for discontent. And I'm not, I'm not there all the time, but I'm there sometimes in that state of mind. So you know, this is still new to me. I've only, as far as like being on my own, I, you know, with the exception of the few months that I lived in Illinois, I, I lived within 20, 30 minutes of the hospital that I was born at. And, you know, now I'm in a different state by myself and I have one friend out here. Um, and we work together and that's amazing. And she's of a, a similar mindset as far as you know, being growth oriented and, and um, self care and growth and you know, wanting more out of life. Um, but she's really the only actual friend I have out here. Um, I have a friend from high school that lives out here um, and we've met, we've met up once um, and we were really close, you know, years ago and, and I'm hoping to, you know, rekindle that friendship. But other than those two people, that's all I have out here. And so it's, you know, it's a little more lonely than I was expecting. And it's, it's causing me to reevaluate the way that I live my life because I'm naturally a very introverted person. I'm alone a lot of the time, generally, especially now because I live alone. Um, and so the more that I'm alone, the more I want to isolate, the more I isolate, obviously the more I'm alone. And so it's, it's uh, challenging because at face value, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with being alone, but on a deeper level, you know, humans are social creatures. We, we want connection. We have a need for community. And that's, that's a portion of my life that I'm lacking right now, as far as in-person community. I have a group of people that I can rely on, but none of them are local with the exception of the one person that I mentioned before. And so 
it's wild. It's, uh, it's wild and I wouldn't change it for anything because it's scary, but it's helping me grow. And that was what I was hoping for when I moved. You know, I really had to decide whether or not I was moving to run away from the situation that I was in or whether I was running towards something better. And uh, I truly believed when I moved that I was running because I wanted to find something better, a, a new way of existing in the world, a, a, you know, to undergo some, some form of challenge, you know, to experience new aspects of life that would get me out of my comfort zone and, and would help me to, to expand and evolve as a person. And I believe that that's what's happening as, as difficult as it is at times. Um, I believe that it was the right decision and you know, tomorrow I'll be four years sober and man, four years ago today, April 22nd, I remember vividly, I did a lot of cocaine. I did a lot of drinking. I stayed up until eight o'clock in the morning, uh, into like the morning into the 23rd. I slept for like two hours and then I went to rehab. And so to go from that to like where I'm at now, it's almost unfathomable because, you know, the majority of my life, I, I wanted to fit in. I wanted to escape reality in some way. And I wanted to avoid responsibility at all costs. And now I still wrestle with, you know, finding out. I'm constantly learning new things about myself and who I am and what I want and what I don't want. And, you know, going through this evolution, but I have actual legitimate goals. I work to achieve them. I don't necessarily always put in a hundred percent effort, but I, you know, it's, it's, um, not, not trial and error, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm learning how to best allocate my time and energy in order to live the life that I want to live. And that's going to come with some give and take and I guess, yeah, trial and error. And so, you know, I, sometimes I feel like I haven't been sober that long at all. Like, you know, I get these, these flashbacks and not flashbacks, but like something will trigger a memory and I'll get this, this aspect of nostalgia. And uh, it brings me right back into it. Like it hasn't been very long at all. And then at other times it feels like, a, like that life didn't even exist. Like it was just a dream. And, you know, on my, on my personal Instagram page, um, the bio, my Instagram profile says, every man has two lives. The second begins when he realizes he has just one. And uh, I truly believe that. And I, you know, while I'm not 100% diligent and remaining present and, you know, constantly working on my, my improvement and, you know, achieving the things that I want and, 
you know, building this business and, you know, X, Y, and Z, all of these things. I'm not a hundred percent with those things all the time, but I'm understanding how to exist in a world that I feel okay in. And, you know, I, a lot of times I don't, I don't give myself enough credit. So I'm overall, I'm in a really good place right now. I have some, you know, obviously some things that I would like to improve, but, but on a macro level, I'm, I don't know if happy is the right word. I am ready to face the challenges that appear before me. And, you know, being happy 24 seven, that's what I thought sobriety was going to be. And it's not. And so <laughs> I'm okay with not being happy 24 seven. It's not realistic. But, you know, the fact that I'm okay with facing challenges and not running away to hide from them, that's, you know, that's a big improvement for me. So, yeah, four years, four years sober. Whoo! It's been a roller coaster. <laughs> mm. um, I'm going to go ahead and end it there. Thank you to anyone who stuck with me this long. Ooh, one, two, three, four. Alignment. Come on. Uh, yeah. Thank you for listening, for coming with me on this, this journey, the comeback journey. If anyone is, you know, struggling with any of these things or, you know, wants to to talk or whatever. If you even just want to, you know, message, shoot me a message. My door is always open. You can find me on either one of my Instagram pages. Uh, this, the comeback journey is at underscore the comeback journey. My personal Instagram page is at underscore Nick Lowry underscore. Uh, N-I-C-K-L-O-W-R-Y underscore at the beginning and the end. I have a website, thecomebackjourney.com. You can email me. You can find me on Facebook uh, at the Comeback Journey or Nick Lowry. Facebook might be Nicholas Lowry. That full name. My door is always open. If you ever want to talk, if you feel as though you could use some guidance from somebody who doesn't always even know where he's going. Um, or if you just want somebody to listen and not say a word, just so you can release some things and have somebody on the other end silent, but know that they're listening. My door is always open. So thank you for listening. Thank you to all of the people who have supported me, you know, my mom, above all else, my mom has been absolutely amazing. My brothers, we don't, you know, we don't have the best relationship. I don't have the best relationship with either of my brothers, but I believe, I truly believe that they want the best for me and that, and that, you know, they've, impacted my life in positive ways. Um, my friends, you know, the, the relationships that I've been in, they've all, they've all impacted me in a way that has got me to where I'm at right now. All the decisions that I've made, all the things I've experienced, they got me to where I'm at and I wouldn't change any of them. So I'm gonna end this because I feel like I'm just gonna keep rambling. Again, my door is always open. Reach out at any time and thank you. 
This concludes another episode of the Comeback Journey podcast. I am incredibly passionate about delivering these messages to a much larger audience, but I can't do that without your help. If today's episode resonated with you, it would mean the world to me if you shared it. Whether that's sending the episode to a friend who needs to hear it, or by taking a screenshot and letting me know what your favorite part was by tagging the comeback journey on your Instagram or Facebook story. Instagram is at underscore the comeback journey. Facebook is simply the comeback journey. I reply to each and every one of you who spreads the word and supports what this brand represents. Thank you, and I'll see you all next time.